Uh, to the, uh, by some count, I believe we are at the 200th meeting. Uh, some have been irregular meetings, some have been regular meetings, but um, here we are. Uh, 200th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, which is, uh, this is now the latest in our regular monthly meetings. Uh, tonight, yay, 200. Uh, give a big round of applause, uh, say to Brian, to Simu, um, to everyone who's been helping organize this, please. Uh, this has been great, Hannah over there. Um, David, um, uh, I'm choking, I'm choking. Oh no, Rob, thank you. Uh, anyway, um, yeah, thank you for everyone for uh, making this work. Um, so tonight we are going to be hearing from uh, Guy Lunardi. I'm saying that with like a French and an Italian or Portuguese accent, I'm sorry, Guy Lunardi, is that right? Anyway, Guy Lunardi, okay. Um, Guy, that's the important part and I missed it. Um, but about building a new kind of Linux distribution, and this is building SteamOS, a Linux gaming OS for the living room. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate Bloomberg for sponsoring uh, us with this space, and thank you everyone uh, who's here tonight for taking the time out and uh, taking the opportunity to come and join us tonight. <laughs> please, please, we're never gonna make it through this. Um, tonight, before we get started, we have our usual requests. Please first silence your cell phones. Um, Two, don't eat any snacks that make noise. If you have brought something that makes noise, it's less of a problem here, but if you brought something that makes noise, please go put it in a cup and bring it back. Um, when it comes time for questions, please use these microphones. There, are, I believe, will be question uh, periods. Uh, Guy will uh, let you know when, it, when he is uh, at a good point for questions. Please come and line up either mic. Uh, just don't, don't call your questions out because then later on, uh, when you want to show the brilliant question you asked, no one will hear you on video. Um, our, uh, just so you know, uh, our next meetup will be our annual mini group meta group holiday party. Uh, that will be, uh, whoa, okay, I had a r different edit on this. I believe that is uh, Monday the 14th of December, is that right? Uh, I still have this listed as November 18th, that would be today. Um, we are uh, still finalizing a lot of the pieces of that. Um, if your employer would be interested in sponsoring the event or if you are part of a group uh, who would be um, interested in participating and we haven't reached out to you, please, uh, I was gonna actually say come and talk to Artie, but I don't see him, so come talk to me afterwards and we'll try to reach out, or Brian in back there with his hand up. Um, so, yeah, so please, uh, you know, block that out. We don't have reservations open, but we will uh, get that going soon. There's a little uh, hold the date right now. What's up? Well, that, that's not quite yet. That was the announcement of the next meeting. That comes next, uh, or that comes in a moment. Um, so I'd like to thank our space sponsor, Bloomberg, and to acknowledge our other sponsors, past and present. That is IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Um, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers um, who have contributed greatly over the years. And I also want to add Spiros as someone else who's here who's been volunteering. And uh, did I miss anyone else? Um, if I, oh, uh, um, nah, he's using his phone. Chris. Thank you, Chris Pick. Um, <laughs> so, um, sorry, I'm taking this a little off track today. I apologize. Um, so, announcements. Uh, workshops, please talk to Hannah or Rob over here. Um, uh, when is the next workshop going to be? Two weeks from yesterday. Okay. So, two weeks from yesterday, and that will be um, at City College at 138th Street in Amsterdam. Um, from 6 to 8 p.m., again, two Tuesdays from yesterday. Right, currently the, uh, the meetup page isn't updated, but check the meetup for the room. Um, second, uh, do we have the Linux distros up in the back this time? Great, so I didn't get a chance to look, but the Linux distros are in the back. If you're interested in trying out one of the distros that are available, please give it a shot. So there's a new boat to 1510. And Fedora 23, those are new. Open Suze something. Sorry, I, um, so um, yeah, they're for you to try for free, give it a shot, take it home. Uh, if uh, you have any interest, uh, please, they're for you. Um, I also wanted to mention that uh, we, that is Nylog, are, are working with another meetup group, Ladies Who Linux, uh, the Kubernetes meetup, and the CoreOS meetups to organize a Kubernetes, uh, or Kubernetes and CoreOS hands-on workshop on December 1st. That'll be downtown at the uh, DigitalOcean offices. Um, 
please look at the Ladies Who Linux NY meetup page to uh, get more info, such as when and uh, how RSVP will be done. We're still finalizing that, but it looks very interesting. The goal will be a hands-on workshop where you sit down and try to launch some things uh, with some help and direction from people from CoreOS and uh, people who work with Kubernetes. Um, all right, so as I said, questions, please uh, use the microphones and Note that at the end of the presentation, there will be trivia questions asked by Guy with material from the presentation. The prizes will be one of the physical or ebook vouchers uh, as per the norm here. Um, we'll cover that again at the end. Now, uh, please welcome uh, Guy Lunardi with Building Steam OS, a Linux gaming OS for the living room. Good evening, everyone. Ladies, gentlemen, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I had the opportunity to attend one of your meetings as, a, as an attendee, so it's a privilege to come back as a, as a speaker. And uh, I look forward to it. It's, it's very exciting for me in many ways, and I'll, I'll illustrate that hopefully through the presentation. So very quickly, uh, my name is Guy Lunardi, as mentioned before. I am not directly affiliated with Valve. I do not work for them in any way, shape, or form. The company I work for is called Collabra, and we provide consulting services exclusively on open source software. As such, we are actually working with Valve to deliver SteamOS. So that's the extent of my relationship with them. I've had the great privilege of working with most of the people in the SteamOS team. They're all absolutely amazing people. Uh, they are passionate about what they do. Actually, everybody at Valve is passionate about what they deliver. And we'll talk about that in a minute. All right. So, and also, I'm uh, speaking on my behalf, not necessarily Valve or uh, Collabra at all. So this is just me and you guys in New York talking about the future of living room computing, not, not just gaming. And that's, that's what I'm very excited about. So first of all, um, it's funny. I, I was listening to John's presentation last year. John works in, in the Valve team. And he said there are two categories of people when it comes to Valve. The first one is they are people that have never heard of them. And the second one is a very passionate group of people that actually very much love what Steam is about. And I thought that was an interesting introduction to it. These numbers show why that is. There is a huge number of user accounts inside of Steam. And that's because Valve as a company initially was a, a, a game company. They're a software company that made an engine, developed a bunch of games that were very successful. And as part of their game platform, they realized that they need the deployment mechanism to be able to distribute their games to their users. Users. Uh, all that is Microsoft Windows based, by the way. All of that is happening in Washington State. All of that is happening very close to Microsoft. All of that is actually done by a lot of people that used to work uh, for Microsoft as well. So there's an interesting dynamic here that we're going to talk about in a little while. Um, they wanted to develop and deploy and make their software available to users, and they've always been pretty aggressive and bullish about their way of delivering software. They wanted to update things quickly and, and make it uh, in the hands of their users and, and iterate through them. And that's where Steam came from. Steam was a way for them to do that. It, uh, then on top of that, they created a community. You could have achievements, talk to friends, network inside of the gaming platform, and that grew and grew and grew. And now, these numbers, um, over 7,000 games today are distributed through the Steam platform. Um, when I checked the, earlier today, there was over 11 million concurrent users using the platform at the same time, which equates to over 2.5 terabytes of uh, bandwidth. So if you don't think this is relevant for your day job, you're probably right. But at the same time, these people kick ass at infrastructure. Um, it's actually kind of funny when you visit their office, there are stacks of hardware everywhere. They're like, hey, we don't need that stuff anymore. They're like, no, anyway. So um, just one game. Again, to try to give you the scale of what they do, Dota 2 is one of the Valve title itself. If I'm going to talk about games, I'm going to focus on Vive uh, video games themselves. They're the only ones I know a little bit about. And full disclosure, my Steam account is literally two days old. I've never played. <laughs> Uh, but I was asked to do this presentation for you guys, and I thought, that would be kind of fun. I care about the project, but I'm not a gamer. How is that going to work out? So I have a controller right here, and if somebody else wants to drive the games when I present, we're probably going to do that. Um, everything that I'm sharing here is public knowledge. You can actually visit the statistics page from Valve, and there are a few other third parties that actually use their data to publish all of this. And it's part of their notion of openness of, of, their, of their platform. Um, from, from the get-go. Um, so, so yeah, let's take a second and think about 
what's changed. Uh, I probably should have introduced myself a little bit better. I've been doing operating system for over 17, 18 years. I've been working in open source for over 10. Um, I've worked for most, uh, for one of the leading distribution for a really long time, and now I work at Collabora where we make software uh, in open source for a living, for people. And if you asked me um, five years ago, if we would be where we are now today with SteamOS shipping available in a GameStop shop that you can pre-order from Dell and get that delivered in the mail, or that you could do a lot of other things, I, I would not have believed you, even though that was my role as a director of, of desktop operating system, at, for example, Suzy, we, uh, that's what we did. But today, think about this. You can, you can officially watch Netflix. You can go on Amazon Video. You can use Hulu and, and all of these other services that just even three, four years ago, we couldn't have dreamed to be able to do. And, and, and I think it's a big realization of how much progress we as a community all around, users, adopters, system administrators, DevOps that are using GNU Linux today uh, have transformed, and, and now that transcends into the living room. It, it's in embedded boxes, whether you use a, a Fire Stick or a Chrome a book or um, a Chromecast or any of those devices that, that have some form of open source software or prominently Linux in it, you can do all of that. And just today, if, if you use news from today, I was trying to find something relevant. Microsoft, right? A, a lot of people keep thinking of Microsoft as sort of the opposite of, of the open source movement, and they couldn't be more wrong today. They've, they've made so much progress in, in their directions and, and the things that they now deliver to be able to do that. So you can now debug Linux apps from Visual Studio. So as a, as a complete transition, those are things that I'd like for you guys to keep in mind when we're talking about just gaming on Linux. It's just like, it's not just that that's changed. It's not that we now have a few hundred, a few thousand video games on Linux. It's the fact that we are winning. We've established a platform that is relevant, that is functional, that drives the web above and beyond many other things. And now, now it's, it's, it's arriving to the living room. So, like I said, um, why not play? I need to figure out how the slides are working. Doo -doo. That's going backward. I'm using Google Slides for the first time, and I'm not sure. OK, we'll go like that. I don't know why the right arrow is not working. That, I'm going to attribute that to the Google online documents and not anything else. So uh, <laughs> I have a PDF version in the back in case that doesn't work well. Um, a lot of people have brought interesting theories as to why Valve has created SteamOS. I'm not going to theorize above and beyond anything that was already shared by them. So one of the core elements that they brought up, and I think it's a very important one, is the fact that there is more and more gated communities around the way applications are delivered. Applications can be games, or can, they can be other stuff. For the purpose of tonight, they'll be games. Um, the Windows Store was sort of one of those things that was a drop in the bucket that made really the people at, at, at Valve consider potentially doing something. But Google Play, Apple iTunes, the Apple Store for, for Mac OS as well, uh, were along all of those platforms that really encouraged Valve to look at potentially doing this better than what was available out there. But above and beyond that, what they really wanted to bring is a TV connected, so think 17 inch uh, display in your living room and provide the best possible 10 feet user experience that you can get. We're not there today and they're not pretending that we're there today, but they're experimenting, they're iterating. And I think that in many ways they've done a better job than anyone else at delivering that so far. So um, I'm very thankful to have a chance to show that to you today. So being able to have a user experience, Steam, the gaming platform, the libraries, the chat, the communities, the interfaces, actually a web browser, and a bunch of other functionalities delivered to you in a way that can be all done and set from this little thing right here. Um, above and beyond that, another thing that was important to them, and one thing I'm particularly thankful to them for, is they wanted it to be open and free, which is something we haven't had to that point. If you take any single one of the game consoles out there, whether it's a Microsoft Xbox or it's a Sony PlayStation, 
um, you can get the OS. You can't tinkle with it. It's something that gets delivered to an ODM, a device manufacturer. They preload the system on top of it. It gets delivered to the shop. And that's pretty much the extent of your interaction with the operating system. Here, it's, it's open and it's truly free. You can find the source codes. You can mess with it. People have already been playing with it. And, and we'll look at all of that. Um, all right. So. Other people I tried before, and they haven't really succeeded at making this happen. And I was trying to study as to what was one of the key things that made a difference here. Why was Valve, in my opinion, succeeding at creating that, that uh, PC living room user experience that other people haven't? And I came to the conclusion that this was the reason why. They actually didn't stop themselves as sort of defining the hardware and trying to define the environment that they wanted to be able to run into, but they wanted to create a true user experience. And through that, they realized that they needed to create a controller that would give them the ability to do that. So this little piece of hardware, not very expensive. Don't quote me. I think it's $50. I'm not sure. Anybody know? It's 50 bucks, right? Yeah, yeah it is. Right. Thank you. Um, you can buy them today. They're shipping. They're available. I don't know if they're in the stores, but they are shipping. You can, you can buy them. And they're really, really cool. So this is part of their whole strategy of bringing the user experience to the living room. And through that, they figured out some of it had to come through the hardware. The Steam controller is a core component of that. Um, the entire user experience is actually managed and available through that. So the first boot experience, you get your Steam box. It comes in one of those boxes. I had already five questions, so I'll confirm. This is not the only model that comes. There is multiple OEMs. This is just the one that I had bought for myself to see whether or not they will ship on the 10th of November. And I'm really happy to say it did arrive on the 10th of November. Yes, Linux preloaded PC that actually is cool to use. I was excited to do that. And I've literally made millions of PCs that were preloaded with Linux before. I've never been as excited as I was when I received this one. And trust me, I had a lot of computers in my hands. Um, this is a, a neat user experience because I was, I was anxious. I wanted to make sure, even though I knew from a project standpoint, that I, I could do what we wanted people to be able to do. So you pop two AA batteries in here, step one. Then you plug this machine into an HDMI display, or in my case, like four, right? I got more than you do. Um, and, uh, and then you can go through the whole out-of-box experience with just the controller. You can enter your Steam account. You can log into your wireless password. You can do all these things that you want to do. I should be completely honest. The first thing you're going to do is wait for us to update the box about four or five times before you can do any of that. Because physically, for the boxes to be here today, we had to stop releasing stuff and put them through the manufacturing process. So the first thing that the Steam machine does, it's updating itself. So that takes a little while, and it reboots, it reboots, and then voila, you get, you get the whole experience. But again, I can't stress enough how important the Steam controller is for the whole platform itself. It's, it's not just about software. It's not just about the open source nature of it. It's about the fact that they are really trying to deliver a, an entire user experience. So the Steam controller is a mouse. It's a keyboard. Um, it's a gamepad. It has all these HIDs. Um, it's fully configurable in the software. You can go in there, you can assign every button, you can assign every gamepad, you can assign all the configurations, reverse them, change the buttons. They've done a lot of work about latency and input control so that you can get really fast feedback and all that. So all of that, again, is configurable. But it doesn't stop there. One of the things that is really cool about it, may not be too much for software people, but you can actually hack the controller itself. If I plop the back over here, behind that plate, you have a couple. Anybody know what these are? They're, 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 they're standard GTAG debug uh, interfaces that you can program the various chips that are on the device. Um, you can find some of those that are not so expensive to hack with. But yes, there you go. It's an NXP chip inside of the controller, and, and you can reconfigure it. So what they're saying is that basically you can do really neat thing. They're not going to limit you in that. And potentially, there will be use cases that people will try to address with those that even Valve hasn't thought about. And if they're really good, they'll try to integrate that. OK, before I go into the details of the distribution, there's a couple more things I wanted to address. Um, like I said, it's, it's a whole approach to gaming that they're trying to deliver. Guys, if you want to come in, there's a bunch of seats inside the room. Don't hesitate to make yourself comfortable. Um, the Steam Link is a really interesting gamble that Valve undertook. They basically said that on paper, mathematically, it is possible to carry over the network all of the signals for video game to your TV. 
What I mean by that is it's literally what the name says. You can stream from your gaming PC sitting in your living room, in your basement, in your man cave, in your lady cave. Um, you, can, you can have that play over there and you, you tinker with that hardware, you update the video card all the time, you have fast SSDs, you have stupid amounts of RAM, which by the way don't make a difference to the speed of your game, but you know. And, and you get all of that, um, but you now want to be able to play on it when you're on the couch. With the Steam Link, you can. It literally is mind-blowing at how low the latency is, and the response time really just enables you to do that. So, again, that's $50, I think. And that doesn't ship quite yet, or if it ships, it's just now. Uh, it's really cool. It works on all the platforms that Steam is supported on. All right, so now let's talk about the Linux gaming specifically. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are over something like 7,000 games in Steam itself, but just about a year and a half ago, there were no games running on Linux at all. And now we are over 1,600. I think at the end of last year, it was only something like 700, so the growth is extraordinary. Um, and, and the titles are of all different kinds, we'll cover that in a minute. When I say sample gamer collection, it's not entirely true. I wanted to acknowledge one of the person that gave me the most help in putting this presentation together. Um, he's an ex-employee of Collabora. He's now working at Zamarin. And uh, Joe Shields were, is an avid gamer, obviously. Otherwise, you wouldn't own 750 games and you wouldn't be on the platform for 11 years. Um, but it seemed like he would be a good resource to help me put this together. So out of all the games that he owns, about 400 of them run on, on Mac as well, and about 200 of is personal library already run on Linux? And that number is only going to grow, um, which is really exciting. And uh, of course, all the Valve titles are working, um, but there are uh, others, uh, independent studios. The difference there is that you want to be able to interface with people that don't have too much technical debt, people that can be pretty agile um, and develop those quickly. It's probably important now to note that um, people recently uh, in the press or otherwise in order to uh, get uh, paper page clicks and things like that have gone out and said, SteamOS isn't as fast as Windows on exactly comparable hardware. And I think anybody that sat down for a minute and thought about it would say, but, well, of course, you don't have to run the test. You can just realize that. Most of those big title video games are developed on Windows for Windows. They're developed for DirectX. They're developed on the drivers that you as a consumer will be able to use. And as a result, they try to optimize it as best as possible for that. And, and the, the studio companies do an excellent job at that. The fact that in the first place, those games even just run on Linux is an accomplishment. The fact that they are playable and you can enjoy them on Linux is, is amazing. And I'm really thankful that they have that. So don't be mistaken in thinking that Valve created this in order to create an even faster gaming experience. Really, it's about the, the living room experience and making it great, I believe. It's my interpretation of it. And, um, and ev eventually, the, the performance will improve. The drivers are already improving. They're, they're better than ever. The packaging is even easier than ever. Um, they are listening to them. Uh, Valve is giving all of us a voice as Linux users. They are actually caring and, and they're talking and working directly with uh, the GPU vendors, including Intel, which is, which is really encouraging. Uh, there are great titles coming. I don't know what they are. Like I said, I'm not a gamer, but I've been told there are great titles coming. And, and also, I wanted to acknowledge the fact that there are a bunch of contractors that are helping studios port their games to Linux as well. Like it's, uh, it's not always super easy, and, it, and it's a big activity. So you know, there's a, there are quite a few games there, and they're continuing to improve, and they're continuing to grow. Um, so the target is really Linux gamers does, didn't exist a year and a half ago. Now it's a category that we can talk about. And I wanted to bring your attention to one thing, which is already just now, and this machine, that box, literally, you know, 10th of November, right there, has more games than the PS4 or the Xbox One. That's pretty amazing, and by a huge factor, I don't know how many games those platforms have, but I was led to understand that, um, they have quite a few more than this, and, and to me alone, again, that's, that's a big accomplishment, and I'm really excited about that. How does it work? How do they deliver this? Um, again, we, myself, and Collabora had nothing to do with this. This is Valve's bread and butter. This is how they brought Steam to Linux. Um, they had 
tremendous binary compatibility issues initially. They picked one Ubuntu Linux release at the time. It was the leading Linux distribution and they thought we'll just do that. And then they quickly realized, oh my God, users are everywhere. If I had you guys raise your hands between Mint and Arc and Debian and Fedora and Rail and whatever else, um, we wouldn't be able to play those games together because it wouldn't run on two machines uh, between any of us. So. That's a bit of a concern uh, for them, and they wanted to figure out a way to avoid that. So they created the runtime. The runtime is a package set of libraries and an assemble of an environment that enables them to target just the runtime and worry less about what's underneath. Uh, SteamOS uses it just the same way you would get it if you downloaded Steam for Linux for your own system. So anything that we're talking about here when it comes for pure gaming, you can do on your Linux distribution. This is just coming in a beautiful package with a great portal UI that gives you the same foot UI. But if you just wanted to play and use the Steam client on your Linux system, you could do that today. Um, that's that. So the runtime has uh, a few interesting quirks. If we, if we look into more details, uh, there are components that are embedded inside of it and there are some of those that are linking outside of it. So with this whole notion today of application containerization and containers in general, as well as system security and all that. The, the runtime is a brilliant way of Valve addressing that on their own. Um, uh, but there are a few things that link outside of it. For example, uh, it still very much depends on the graphics libraries that exist outside of the Steam runtime, um, which is one of the things that is very challenging. And, and you still have to interface with other components on the system as well, obviously. Uh, to be able to get all of the functionalities that you need. Um, but Mesa is a relevant example because there's been a lot of work that's going in there and we're considering trying to find other more clever way to make all that work uh, moving forward. So I found that quote um, kind of interesting. It's somebody posted that on the forums a few days ago. There was an argument. And one thing that the Steam users are very good is they have a very active community. They self-help each other very, very much and do a, a really good job at it. Um, and somebody was complaining about the fact that why did they do all this effort if it's just basically Steam on top of, of Debian? Well, it's not just that. There's a real significant amount of work that these guys have, have put in there. And, uh, and I'm, 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 play, I'm pleased to say that they chose to do it on top of, of, of Debian, which is something we, we know really well and, and, and love. Um, so there's a couple of core ex, uh, elements of Debian. If you're not familiar with that community, I won't bore you uh, with the details. But those three documents basically drive Debian in a way that no other Linux distributions have. They think of themselves as something a lot bigger than just a Linux distribution. That's why they have so many contributors and so many Debian developers. They really like uh, what they get out of that. For us as a, as a company, we subscribe to all of this and we try to help our customers ad adhere to all of that. But I'll just leave that as that for now. Um, so SteamOS is over three years now, I would say. Uh, but more recently, they decided to move to the latest stable release of Debian. It's codenamed Jesse, and its version number is 6.0. You guys already know all that. Um, the last version was, was Wizzy, and um, we're not using Unstable. Uh, some people are asking that. The reason is that we want to be able to leverage um, uh, the stability that comes from using a stable release of, uh, of Debian. So all of the CVE and security and updates and so on get pulled back in automatically, and it's a very natural flow. And I'll talk about how <coughs> Everything is packaged and delivered through the different repositories. Uh, but that was a conscious decision that they had made. They had this process running for quite some time on the Wheezy version, which is Debian 7. And uh, shortly before we were to release, it was decided that it made sense to update to the new um, Debian 8.0 uh, and, and do that. So you can see it's, it's not that long ago, November 10th for the hardware shipping, which means we had to freeze quite a while ago. And, uh, that was only available uh, on April 26th, but uh, it's pretty cool. If, um, if people don't know that, I, I thought most of you do, but there are some non-technical people here. If you look at all these code names, they're all characters of Toy Story. All right, so now let's look under the cover. Um, like I said, uh, Debian 7 turned into what was called Alchemist. If I start talking about SteamOS 2 or if I talk about Brewmaster, it's not because I'm tired, it's because those were the code names for the current version of it. So um, that just I wanted to clarify that. 
It is very much Debian. Uh, one of the things that they tried to do was stick as close to the derivative distribution that they were coming from as possible. They wanted to maximize their leverage from the community. And, and it's a very important uh, advantage that they get. Uh, they're using standard hardware, x86-64 instruction set. It's a pretty simple platform to do Linux on. And, and using Debian as a baseline gives you 35, 40,000 package, however many we have right now, and, and being able to do all of that. And it's also giving them the platform that they have something stable they know they can always go back to. So when they start breaking themselves, they can roll back changes and, and go back to something that actually works and very solid. So uh, Debian is a really good base. We, we use that here. We, we've used it with many other customers, so we're, we're quite comfortable with that. Um, all right, so um, on yesterday, the last time I checked, the last version was 2.49 already. <laughs> yes, like I said, they iterate fast. Um, and everything is quite well documented. You can find all the information around the distribution and the platform online. Uh, they're using uh, easy and, uh, tools that you can reuse, and, and things look like this. You probably can't read. I didn't mean that for you to read. Uh, the slides will be uploaded later on. But that gives you an idea of, uh, of the things that they change and the stuff that they update. So latest graphics driver that goes through a lot of iterations every time. Um, much newer kernel than what's available in Jesse. They've actually gone to a, a 4.1 based Linux kernel. Kudos to them for being that aggressive and using something quite new. Um, 4.1.6 previously, it's now going to something a lot newer than that. Uh, as well, and, uh, and picking solid sets of patches on, on top of that and delivering them. Uh, there's nothing in this list or anywhere else that you can't just take and rebuild yourself. The only thing that's a black box is the, team, the Steam client itself. Everything else is just Debian with a few changes that are available readily and that you can reuse for yourself. So uh, again, the main thing is the, the, the experience, the way that you're gonna get it, it's gonna be packaged. You're gonna get a Steam machine with a Steam controller. The Steam machine will be preloaded with Steam OS and, and that's really the way that it's intended to be delivered. If you wanna do the installation yourself, you can. They are pre-made images that are available out there. You can find them through the Steam powered website or the Steam community. Uh, but it's not really meant to do that. It's pretty drastic in terms of how it installs. It literally will take over your drive. So you know, handle with care. Um, there are a few different ways to, to do it, but uh, you can look at the system requirements online and you can build your own Steam machine. There is no restriction. The only thing is it sort of needs to look like that. Uh, if you have an old laptop sitting around and you want to get Valve Steam OS running on it, it won't be a great experience. Chances are it may not even work. Uh, even though they listen to a lot of feedback from the users and they've supported all their hardware and they've done some work, it is absolutely not their priority. They're working with the OEMs to get, excuse my French, KeyCast hardware out of it and the best performance possible to be able to get people the best gaming experience they can on top of that on a large screen, right? So you can install it yourself. Uh, you're welcome to do so. Um, but first and foremost, it's, it's a package solution and it's meant to be delivered that way. Also, all, uh, people do all sorts of weird things. They are trying to dual boot SteamOS with Windows. Why the hell would you want SteamOS with Windows if you can run Steam on Windows already? Things like that. But I guess it's sort of an exercise in futility for some people. They're welcome to do that. It actually works. It's been proven to work. There is, again, no limitation. It's Debian underneath. So you can do all of that. Um, and. Um, there's a few exceptions in terms of what's not considered uh, similar to Debian. There is an end user license agreement, or EULA. You know, it's that thing that has a bunch of text in it you guys never read. I'm one of those weird people that actually read those because, well, that's part of my job. But um, the SteamOS one is actually well written. It's very short. It's only going to take about a minute of your life. So if you ever get one, I invite you to read that one. The funny thing is number five. It also comes with usually an OEM EULA. Say you get the one from Alienware Dell or Zotac, some of the other vendors. So you have this one for SteamOS, and then you get something like that for, for the OEM. Don't read that one. It's boring. But you can't do much about it anyway. Um, but it's broken down in three key components, and I wanted to highlight that to you guys. The SteamOS itself, the collective work, what actually comes out of putting Debian and putting it all together. Then it talks about your license agreement and your right between you, Valve, and the world around free software specifically. And then finally, there is the notion of proprietary Steam client and the fact that, yes, it's not open source and probably not going to be open source in any short term. It's part of their bread and butter. That's how they make their money, and that's how they can help us make create things with open source. And finally, 
They also have third-party proprietary software. Here, you know, plug in your NVIDIA driver, plug in your um, AMD graphics driver, and so on um, as well. So it's structured that way. It derives a little bit. It's not exactly fully compliant with things like the, the free software guidelines that Debian would have and others. But let's just be honest and clear with each other. This is first and foremost a product. This is for people that are not exactly you and I, that we could sort all this stuff out on our own. We could install all these drivers, we could make these machines work. But imagine how powerful it is that now, instead of being stuck in a proprietary closed world of buying an Xbox One somebody, you can give them something more like that and, and give them a taste and a, an idea of what could be done um, with free software and on top of that, it's a brilliant living room experience. So that's really exciting. Okay. Um, maybe before I launch into those details and we sort of switch gear in terms of technical details, if there are a few questions, I invite you guys, if you want to come up to the mics, we can do a few questions now if anybody has them. Otherwise, I can carry on and, and keep presenting. But I thought that uh, before I give you some details on how the distribution is actually put together, maybe, maybe there are a few questions. So if you don't mind popping up and then getting to the mic, that'll be great. Yes, sir. So how did you, how did you get roped into this? Um, well, I guess I can, I can share that. We, uh, as, a, as a company, we work closely with... Uh, with key open source individuals, and one of them was invited to meet with Valve and provide his view and, and opinions around the technology. And as a result, uh, we ended up working with Valve, and, and that's really kind of cool. And they're they're really wonderful people to work with. I, I couldn't be up here, um, and they're they're damn smart, uh, especially when you think of their background. They they all worked for Microsoft for a long time, and so they. They, they know operating systems really well, and, and, and they bring all of that knowledge to, to open source and, and now using it on Debian, which is, which is really cool. Yes, sir? Uh, you said it's uh, De uh, Debian 8 yep. under the hood. Is it going to update itself to Debian 8 too when you buy it? Um, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. In terms of the details for that, the, the question was excellent. It was about the difference between 8.0 and 8.2 and the other releases. So there's a tool in here. It's called out. It's called Merge on MISC. And I'll talk about that in a second on how it actually brings those changes for, for the users automatically. Yes, sir. Why, <clears throat> uh, why the kernel version bump? Well, why the uh, major kernel version bump? Uh, is there any specific features? Because other otherwise, it's mostly just a number unless you have a specific feature that you wanted, a subsystem that you wanted, either bug fixes Absolutely. or upgrades. Absolutely. So it, it's not just trying to keep as close to current as possible. Um, a lot of what's in here is really current hardware, and it was a lot easier. There is a decision point at which we decided, does it make sense to backport a whole lot of things? For example, wireless, graphic, uh, wireless drivers and, and wireless interfaces, or is it just easier for us to roll a new kernel out and make sure that the stability and compatibility is still there? So it's primarily for hardware compatibility reasons, and we're gonna continue to do that. Actually, we are already looking at potentially yet a newer version because it brings some feature and functions that we need. So it's, you know, it, it, the drive is primarily hardware compatibility, really. Yes? Uh, does, does the Steam Link share any internal like software similarities with the Steam machine that you know of? I do not know. Um, I would be kind of surprised if it did because it's a really, really tiny optimized. Think of it as a really fancy video deck that also does a little bit of input manipulations inside of it. Um, I don't know how much of it is disclosed publicly, so I don't want to say anything, but I, I honestly do not know the answer to your question. <laughs> Hi, uh, since the whole box is a distribution, <laughs> is there any issue with GPL software on the box? Ah, yeah. Um, uh, that, that question had to come up, right? Um, that's the reason why the ULI is in there. That's why those license agreements are in place, is so that the responsibility is sort of understood. If, if you wish to stick to very strict, um, even over open source initiative or SI guidelines, or if you use the Debian software uh, guidelines, uh, then there are potentially some concerns that you have there. It's all a matter of how it's packaged together and delivered. Uh, we feel that the value of the proposition of delivering it to the customers that way and, and getting a finished product uh, is, is the focus. So we, uh, I myself as an end user, uh, I am fine using that. I can't answer on behalf of Valve in any way or Alienware or Dell or Nvidia or AMD or Intel or anyone for that matter. Um, but uh, just think about the user experience. You get a controller, it 
freakingly work. You plug it to your TV, it just, the mode setting works, it doesn't flicker, you never see any text, it just renders, and, and it's a beautiful thing for all of us that have struggled with Linux for so long. It's a beautiful experience. So, um, I'll make mine really quickly. Um, so, is, um, does Valve have any uh, plans to try to lure developers in to try to build the game library that's available for SteamOS and Linux to try to say, hey guys, this is a viable platform. Why don't you guys help us by pointing more games to the platform and make it more attractive to other people? And this is just me and not Valve, but I have a feeling they're already doing that. I've, I've been in their offices where they've been working brutally away at enabling other people's games, their own, uh, answering questions, helping them. They're, like I said, there is a whole slew of subcontractors that are working with uh, the game studios to help them come to the runtime. Because let's just face it, it's really just making it work in the runtime. That's sort of your environment right now. Um, so yeah, this is happening. Um, it's not really their core business in a way, so at one point, you know, there's a rationale that needs to kick in, and I'm not going to pretend I can speak to that. Um, but remember, year and a half, two years ago, zero games, now 1,600 in any realm of, you know, it's already brilliant, and, and, and I'm, I'm really happy with, with that trend. Yes? Uh, is Valve enforcing a open source hardware policy for both the controller and for the OEM boxes? They, I, again, it's just me, but I don't think they could um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, if you want the latest hardware, you just basically unable to do that. Uh, there are some really cool open platform initiatives out there and potentially somebody could try to do one in conjunction with using Debian's TeamOS as a derivative and make that work there. Um, but I think that people like Alienware, when they put a sleek box together like this and they do a drop ship pre-order with people where they invest a lot of money to get that in the hands of the end users, there is a certain value chain that we have to understand there. As far as open hardware is concerned, I'm sure they'll get there, but they already give you more access to the hardware than anybody else before, so. So I'll repeat that for everybody. The, the follow-on question was, do you have access to that? And I've been told, I haven't confirmed it myself, but if you email them, they'll send you all the CAD files for the boards, they'll send you the designs for this controller, they'll give you access to almost anything you want. Uh, the internals of the NXP chips and other stuff they don't have access to, of course not. But that you can go get from the other vendors if you wanted to. So their intention is really to sort of be a driver for innovation there. And they've sort of done that one rev, actually more than one rev, I've seen so many versions of this one that I wanted to make sure I brought one that was a commercial version. Um, it's, it's brilliant, uh, it's open. I haven't seen too many acts on it yet, but I'm sure they'll come and they'll be amazing. Um, is it OpenGL under the hood? <laughs> and if, uh, is there any help from Valve to help all these major designers that are uh, married to open, uh, to uh, um, you know, uh, the Microsoft, DirectX? the Direct, DirectX <laughs> interface? Is there any kind of shim or um, between uh, games that are designed for uh, DirectX that are not necessarily going to run well on uh, OpenGL. Yes, um, there is a. Go on. I have a question. Okay, do you want to come to the mic if you don't mind? We'll give you a chance to speak up. Thank you. Now, Valve actually has a uh, application on GitHub called 2GL for converting Direct3D to OpenGL. It's like a, I, I think it's a tool to automatically uh, convert shaders and to you know from uh, uh, I can't even remember the name, but you know 2GL SL. So yes. He's absolutely right. There's a bunch of tools out there. There are other people providing even more tools to help with all of that. Um, ultimately, it is a gaming platform, and all those game studios have a long history with a platform that they're all familiar with and APIs that they've been writing to. Even though, we must say, those have matured and evolved quite a lot. DirectX 12 on Windows 10 is sort of a whole new thing, right? Um, but yeah, eventually that will need to evolve as well, and we hope that now with Steam, for Linux and Steam OS, it's becoming a key contender that people will consider alongside of the PS4 and the Xbox One and everything else. I'm just curious, was Wine ever considered ah, to use the, the kind of compatibility layer? I can only give you the answer that John gave to that question one year ago when he said that it's not a Valve's position to be able to deliver that because they can't support it, who's faulty, who is, if that didn't work or this didn't work, etc. So, so um, 
of course, as technicians and engineers, it was brought up, I imagine, in one meeting room. It was written on the whiteboard, probably, and it was quickly scratched off, I imagine. Um, again, it's JC, it's Linux. If you wanted to add wine to it, it's probably two command lines you have to run in order for you to be able to do that, so have at it. Um, same thing with all of the game emulators. Actually, one of the key derivatives to SteamOS is somebody that wanted that. They Not so much wine, but they wanted some other um, games that are not Steam games to be available on the machine. And uh, it's not something that Valve does, so he went out and did it himself and um, delivered all that to users, so yeah. All right. I'll, um, Thank you guys so much. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll mention some of the build process. So as this slide has been up for a while, um, we're using OBS, the open build service, in order to be able to rebuild all of the Debian packages inside at Valve. And the reason they do that is they want to have full control of it. Uh, in order to be able to iterate, to answer your question earlier, there's a tool called MergeOMISC that basically constantly monitors the upstreams for the distribution. So the Debian repositories for source packages themselves and a few other sources of information as well, whether that being other drivers or other projects that we're pulling in as well. And whenever they're coming in, there is a workflow that kicks in and then it, if it can be automated, it gets automated, those packages get rebuilt automatically, they get validated, they work, we end up with a new image of the software. And that happens automatically all the time, hence the name. However, if there is a workflow that you require manual intervention or a validation by a user, we have the ability to do that. It will create a flag. Somebody at Valve validates it, makes sure that it looks all nice and pretty and functional, and then that makes it into the build as well. On the other end of that spectrum, all of the Valve source that needs to be available publicly is hosted on GitHub under the Valve software account, and there you'll find uh, uh, all sorts of things, like somebody was asking about the kernel, so their kernel tree is available on, on, on GitHub, and you'll find the, the root version of it and all the patches as well as all the numbering, so you can find them. Um, and, and that's pretty easy to follow, and it's easy to rebuild as well if you wanted to be able to do that. The rationale for a lot of those is available into GitHub issues, which is where a lot of people are providing direct feedback on the distribution. So people that have been building derivatives of SteamOS already, yes, they are derivative of a Debian derivative already, which are available uh, for SteamOS, and those guys have been helping uh, test and validate all that already. So uh, by default, you only get the Valve SteamOS repos on your machine, that means that the machine can update itself and you cannot opt out of it to still help answer your question. The machine makes itself up to date by itself. It's, it doesn't present the user with a, I have an update, do you want to update? It just does all that decision making tree for you. Um, whenever you start or reboot the machine, it will take the opportunity to apply updates at its leisure. Um, and it does so really well. It has the ability to fall back quite elegantly if an update doesn't apply properly or if something wrong went uh, from, from a download or an application standpoint uh, uh, in order to apply the patch. So all of that is happening. It's transparent from the user. You don't really see any of that. There, there are two important streams of updates. There is one specifically for the Steam UI, the Steam client, the portal UI, the app itself, and this is the one for the whole OS underneath that. So, so you get these updates a little bit separately, um, and you can check them manually if you want. You can, there is a UI that enables you to do that, where you can go in and, and see where the updates are. Um, so you can, you can do that. Um, I can actually, because we've been on here for so long and I don't want to bore you guys to death, maybe we'll take a test drive. How about that? So let's drop out of the slides. Um, this is Ice Weasel running on Debian. If you have never run Debian, Ice Weasel is basically their version slash fork of uh, Mozilla Firefox. Um, so that's their web browser, and that was the window I was using until now. The slides are built in uh, Google Slides. And that shows you that uh, HTML just works. You can use a web browser, uh, and that all just works magically. It's wonderful. The desktop is a uh, GNOME shell, GNOME free uh, desktop, and uh, with all the typical use cases that you would have, uh, the apps over there. I can open up the drawer. You can see all my apps over here. I can search for applications. You'll find them right there. Ooh, look at that. I already had the terminal open. Uh, with fonts that you guys can read. So if I do something like that, you can see where we are. There. That's the machine. And uh, the star, what is it? Really star? 
Yeah. Yeah. There you go. So that's uh, that's what's currently running on that box. I am actually using a Steam machine to do this presentation for you guys, and I'm using slides online to be able to do it. If I wanted to use them locally, I have this little handy um, PDF version of the slides, which I also just downloaded uh, somewhere. That's not it. That's the document view viewer for GNOME uh, itself. There is very little changes to the GNOME packaging from J Debian Jesse. Literally, I think there's like three or four patches, nothing more than that. Um, they changed the font size so that it's usable on a 10-foot UI. And they've done a few other customizations so that you, when you're sitting on your couch and you're using this, you're able to access it. Uh, but the most interesting thing you guys are probably curious about, because you've all seen these windows plenty of time before, uh, is what happens when I click on this icon over there. So there is a way of switching between the two different sessions. So uh, I have a bunch of different virtual terminals. One of them basically gives me this UI. Um, probably important to note as well. Somebody will ask otherwise. This is still X11 based. So this is using the X11 protocol. It's the XORG server. The reason is all the games were ported to work on top of that. So Wayland doesn't necessarily quite make sense for them right now. The, the, the implementation and all of the continuation of the work that they've done all the way from early boot process, UEFI, and over to the bootloader, uh, transfer over to the Linux kernel, all the way to the first desktop session is very seamless, so you don't have any flicker or anything like that. And because of that, you get this. But uh, yeah, it's, um, it's all right here. Uh, if we do something like that, you'll see uh, in order to get all these screens running, we had them connected, it's running at full HD, and we're running at 60 frames per second on this system right here. So enough about that. If I click here, I'll show you uh, this right there. This is how you do it. Beautiful IPC mechanism that if we do that, it will run this debus command, and it basically will tell the system to go ahead and switch back to the zero seat, which is the other display where the actual Valve compositor is running, where the magic happens. So finally, a double click here is gonna take a second. Hopefully it will work. I haven't actually tried that since we set up. So we're gonna be doing some nice, interesting video debugging. Look at that. We are now into the portal UI, Steam UI. And I'm gonna turn the controller on and I can drive using this now. So the first thing I can do up here is switch back to the desktop mode, which we just came from, so we're not gonna do that. I can still use the keyboard and the mouse, by the way. It's still a full user experience. I wanted to give you a smooth transition. I didn't wanna to be too aggressive, so look, Google Slides inside of the Chrome Embedded Web Browser inside of the Portal UI. How cool is that? It's actually working. I can go full screen. I can present from here as well. And let's start from the stop ag top again. My name is Guy Lunardi. <laughs> All right, let's not do that. Um, this is the UI. Uh, this is my friend UI. I think if I go twice again, this is what you see literally if I don't do anything else. This is what you see when you first log in. That's the portal UI. That's the stand foot view that you can drive using this controller when you get home and you order one of those. And I would be very happy if you did. Um, so yeah, that's, um, that's it. There's a lot of room for uh, additional components right now if I open the library. The library only has my games over here. Um, as I said, I, uh, I only have uh, Valve games uh, because that's the only ones I have access to. Uh, you can see all the ones that uh, I can play over here. We're not gonna do any of the violent ones because I'm easily scared. Um, <laughs> You can add videos as well. Uh, there is room in that UI to do other stuff. We could add music, we could add uh, other sorts of content, photos, etc. So expansion is conceivable that Valve would potentially bring other things to your library going forward, or there will be other ways to expand that. There is the community side of things. Hopefully if the wireless is fast enough, we can see some of that coming up or not. Let's try again. Um, maybe we're not online. Did it say it's offline somewhere? Yeah. Oh yeah, look at that. Let me see. Why am I offline now? Let's see, we'll go and drive that. See, I'm using the controller to do all this. Network, uh, configure net, what did it say here? Configure network, network strength. No, we should be online. A. I don't remember the password, I'm not gonna enter it. No, I, I think I was online because the web is working. It's just lying to us uh, right now. I, I, it was working earlier. I'm not going to worry too much about that, but 
if we try to do something else like create a new presentation. Does that work? Yes, let's see. That works, right? We're online. Um, it's okay, I'm not gonna worry about this. Um, we can play the games that I have locally. Um, that's the whole user experience. You can see your messages up here. They pop up, uh, new controller status. It's working, I'm using it. Uh, your message is coming this way. You can turn it on, turn it off. Uh, you can do uh, quick shortcuts by long press buttons on the controllers as well. Go back to the desktop, etc. So, pretty cool, huh? I'm really blown away by this. Obviously, if I go to the store, it's not gonna work right now. Maybe if we have a minute and I can switch the machine, I will try to connect, uh, to try to reconnect the box. Uh, but in the meantime, I just wanted to take a, a quick drive at that. So I'm gonna click over here again. I'm gonna switch back to the desktop mode. Uh, yeah. And it's doing the same thing the other way around, so it's literally just switching back to the next one. It's Control alt f7 Control alt f8 for those that are curious about the keyboard way to do that. Now we're back over here. It still works, thank you guys, technique, it works. So we had a little issue when we first connected it. It detected the weirdest uh, video resolution at like 25 hertz, but we sorted it out as a team. It was a beautiful thing. Um, all right, um, what else could I show you very quickly? Uh, I guess you may be curious about this, so I'll do that. Uh, what is it called, source.list? Is it too big? Let me, no, it should be good, right? So um, over here, you get the uh, architecture, the content, where it's coming from, uh, the repositories that are the internal ones that are getting set up, the different uh, versions as part of it, the famous non-free that you need for that. Um, if you are interested in running Debian, we have a very, very fast local mirror right here. The Columbia University gives us access to all of Debian very quick, very fast. It's very nice. So I added that over here so I can do a few extra things that you can do out of the box otherwise and added software such as uh, an SSH server that doesn't come by default. Um, you can SSH into the box uh, by default. Uh, I wanted to be able to do that to prepare the presentation, so I just went on there, added the repository, updated it, uh, pulled one package, and off I was online. Yes, question? Oh, sorry, wait a second. We will be able to hear you in just a moment. She's entering your password in the tablet. We're good. Uh, can we see the internal storage? Uh, yeah, you want to see the this configuration? So yeah. We can easily do that. Uh, I'm just going to do this. Okay, that's not the most user friendly to do that. Uh, but, uh, I'll, I'll, oh, you just wanted to see that? Yeah. Um, so, the, the, you guys are humans, I guess. Yeah. I like the, anyway, it's funny. Some people don't change it in, they're running top with system numbers, but they want to see TF with user numbers. Now, that's the layout. Is that right? Yeah, that's all good. Um, the way some of that is laid out is also sort of predefined um, by, um, uh, by Valve. And, and that's one thing that actually is gonna change. They've actually publicly stated that they wanna do some really interesting stuff around this uh, in terms of file system layout and moving away from potentially just uh, package-based updates and doing more file system OS3 type distribution updates. So that's being currently looked at. And can they do free minus M? Yes. <laughs> This one has eight gig. Uh, that's, uh, you, I think the first ones start at four. Uh, I think they go all the way to 16 commercially. The system requirements are available online somewhere uh, in their website. And if, we, if you look at it, you can see uh, on that, li la, that link somewhere, let me see if I just do that, uh, Steam OS build your own. I think that's the name of the webpage. Yes, look at that. Uh, those are the system requirements that they ask you to have. So you don't need that much uh, memory to be able to run it. Yes, sir. Uh, one more. Can you go back to the terminal and do uh, cat slash pros slash CPU info? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> um, that one I knew the answer to. It's not the easiest one to read, but it's a... Uh, An i7? Yeah, seven cores. Um, and it's an uh, i7 uh, 4885, which I don't know exactly what that is, but it's a pretty high-end version. It's more of a middle of the road. Haswell architecture. Huh? Haswell. As well, yeah, it is as well. So it's not quite yet uh, the new um, 
Skylake and things like that. But we are active, we as a company are actively working together with Intel and others to bring all that forward. But these, you know, it's a compromise between wanting to make them run right and um, I, these are pretty freakingly fast PC for what you're getting. And as far as gaming is concerned, the extra gain you're going to get are not going to be from the core CPU itself. They're going to be from the GPU optimizations. And that stuff is things they're working on. They're actually working on closely with a company to do that. I'll mention them in a little bit. Yes, sir. Speaking of which, and more with the terminal, can we get an LSPCI and an LSUSB? Uh, yeah, do you want all that on this screen? Okay. Uh, how about that instead? Uh, <laughs> So there, you have the answers. So the, the processor generation shows up right there. Uh, it's Intel, uh, Intel Wireless as well. Uh, Intel networking, I think. So yeah, Intel Wireless right there. Uh, NVIDIA graphics, you get the generation right here. Uh, which, 960, right? 860. 860. Yeah, 860, I'm right here, you're right. You guys are answering all the questions I was going to ask in the raffle without even knowing the answers, so that's good. Um, let's, uh, so one more question to go ahead and then we'll, please. Um, Make it a good one, no pressure. <laughs> it is a good question, thank you. Please. Um, have any of the, um, has this effort caused any mainlining uh, contributions to the kernel as far as hardware goes, or because it's Intel, there isn't any need for that? It's a really good question. Um, I am trying to think of a specific example of, you asked for Linux kernel specifically. Has there been any patches? Um, we work, we as a company and Valve also are pretty aggressive at a lot of this. I don't know if there is anything specific that went back to LKML as a patch that was submitted because of that. But I'm sure that if I foraged really hard, I could find something. There's been, uh, submitted patches for other projects. For example, there's some apt changes that went back to Debian specifically for their, uh, their package resolution mechanisms and things like that. There are other work that we've done where we've patched uh, various projects and we're still doing that. And all that work is ongoing. Um, as far as kernel itself, you're right. It's a very good question. I'm not sure. I, I can't point you to a specific comment that would map to that, but I'm sure that there must be one. Was that? Dejun is telling me that they were updates. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, buddy. Yes, that's right. Um, some of those haven't been accepted yet, uh, but uh, Dejun is reminding me that um, a, a big chunk of the work has gone in from Valve to work specifically on the Microsoft Xbox 360 controller. So they've done a lot of work in the kernel as well as in uh, free desktop Xorg to be able to improve a bunch of things around that device specifically. All of those patches are used in here and they've been discussed upstream. Some of it has been accepted, some of it is still being discussed as well. So yeah, good, good example of that. Uh, and they're doing things with, with other uh, human interface device efforts to be able to do more of this as well. Obviously, it's a critical component for players. Uh, it's one place where we can tinker with it a lot better than, than you could on Microsoft Windows. All right. Um, yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, the UI looks distressingly like XBMC. Is that an unfortunate accident? You mean the, the portal UI itself? Um, I, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've not run XBMC myself for a long while. There are a lot of users in the forums that are asking about that type of applications to be able to be added to the 10-foot UI here. People talk about the Kodi.tv project, XBMC came across as well, there's a bunch of others. Um, those are 10-foot UI user experiences. Of course, I'm sure they were inspiration came from that. Um, there's also some limitations. Some of those UIs are patented, believe it or not. Uh, companies like Sony and other actually control some IP around that stuff. So you, you have to be careful around that. And if XBMC did some things right, you'll find them here. If there are innovations here that are not there yet, I, I imagine people will start reusing them over there as well. So, so yeah, I, I don't know if it's intentional or not. Um, all right, let's take a look at some of the other things. So we've mentioned some of the repository. How are we doing on time? Okay, all right, oh, we'll, do a few. we'll do a few more slides here. Uh, packages, like I just said, there's no SSH daemon on it. We're using a, a quick example of things that we're still iterating through. Um, 
Time synchronization with the boxes is a little bit of an issue. There are some few quirky things about it. Uh, around the gaming side as well, you don't want to have enormous skews or the games are going to start thinking you're fiddling with your time and stuff like that, uh, I guess. But, uh, but that's being worked on as an example. I've mentioned there are very few tweaks uh, from GNOME by default. Um, the desktop session starts with the desktop user. I'll talk about that in a minute. I've already covered this. I just want to give a shout out to the Lunar J. Uh, people um, that are working closely with Valve, they are being funded by Valve to develop uh, improved Mesa support on Intel platforms. And that's critically important because those are the entry level systems for the gaming platforms. You are interested in the specs. These actually can run on Intel GPU and as well based Intel GPU as we just established as a group. So the newer generations will only bring better graphics performance and then you'll be able to do even more gaming and play on um, on those systems there, which is, which is really good. Um, the security is, is, is a focus, but it's not tremendous. We, they wanted to enable you to be able to play with it. There is no password by default, and the desktop user has full sudo capabilities. You can break yourself real fast, real nice. <laughs> Smooth sailing all the way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's what's beautiful about it. You, you're in full control. You can change anything you want on top of it. The, full, the file system is fully accessible. It's fairly close to a standard Debian system. As they look forward, they may want to make some technical choices that will harden the Steam client portion of it while remaining uh, an open platform as well, of course. That, that, that priority doesn't change. Um, some things that are not on there, I just wanted to bring them up. There is no Google Chrome browser or Chromium browser on the user experience side. It's a Chromium embedded browser inside the portal UI, the one you saw us use when we were in the game platform. There is no Java VM or there is no Flash player. Yes, sir? Speaking of having uh, full access, uh, what, what's the process when you inevitably hose your machine? Oh, to get yeah. it back up and running. The, you saw that the, when we were looking at the file system, there's a whole bunch of different partition layouts, right? So there's a bunch of uh, A-B testing revert for itself, so it will try to fall back to a different system if it can. And if it can't, one of our guys designed that, and it's really clever. We're actually using it in some automotive use cases where we have Linux-based system in cars, and that's where some of that logic is coming from. Uh, but if that fails, there is a notion of recovery partition capabilities that's there. But chances are, if it's you, and your cap backward, you screwed up royally. And uh, there, is a, there is a USB UEFI image that you can get online. You can just plug that in. It will literally reimage the machine. So it's not super flexible. It's, it will make a Steam machine out of the Steam machine again. Don't try to do dual boot systems with that and so on. There's a bunch of clear warnings around that. I think I had the slide about that earlier. So, so yeah, you can recover. They, because it's free and open software, there are binary file images available for, uh, I think, optical drives and USB that you can just reflash for yourself. I don't think there's one in the box. I haven't checked, but I don't think there is. Um, yes, sir? Does it support multi-users? Does it support multi-users? Uh, that's a loaded question, because there's a lot of ways to answer that. I am not a strong Steam user, but it's my understanding that, yes, as part of these initiatives, Steam brought multi-user capabilities to the Steam client. So you can share within your household games with other people in your house. With the whole notion of Steam Link, you can share games that way as well. So there is multi-user capabilities that way. If you're asking purely from a Linux perspective, I only know of, we could check, but there's only, I only know of root and that desktop user. But once you're taking your sudo capabilities, you can create other user accounts and you can log out, log back in of the desktop environment there as well. So there is no limitations to that. Actually, no, I lied. I think I saw there's a 1,000 and 1,001 user and zero. So there's at least three users. I guess the first one is for the, the Steam session itself, uh, which will make perfect sense. Um, did I answer your question? Great. Catch a Sorry? Catch a One more time. Catch a server password. Can you set a password? No. Yeah. You could just catch. Oh, yeah, yeah. I could do that to figure it out. Yes. I think that's how I. Yeah, yeah. Um, that was the suggestion. So, yeah, there is a Steam user and there is a desktop user, as I expected. The first one is just for the, the Steam session. And they're running in isolated VT. They have their own desktop environment. They've done some customizations there. It's got its own compositor manager. The Steam client always runs full time. And it has an understanding with the composition manager. So even when you're overlaid, the full screen game runs on top of it. If the game fails, 
because you're out of process tree, the, uh, the compositor can still take over and you still have responsiveness, so you can kill that and stuff like that. So you saw that pop-up UI when I pressed the button, things like that. You can still do all of this, regardless of what the game is doing underneath, unless it's completely pegging the system. But at that point, you'll have the same problem in any game console system or any PC system you have. And we've looked at the specs, right? It's pretty powerful. If you get to that point, I would be careful about that thing not catching fire more than anything else. <laughs> Um, I, I've mentioned how to go back. I showed you that command. It's kind of cute that they've, they've built the intelligence inside of the system to be able to go back and forth, so a non-technical user can do that. I should bring up that by default, you don't have access to the desktop mode. It's something you have to voluntarily turn on. Uh, if, we, if we go back to that real quick, I can show you uh, if I can find it again. If we switch to terminal, this takes a second because we're going through all their magic. I can see it already here, but it's just syncing to the other screen. So if I go down, I need to turn this guy back on. I'll just drive this way, it'll be faster. If I come in here, I think under interface, no, not audio interface, under system. You, this is where I was saying you can see separate updates from the Steam client itself and the Steam OS itself. So you, you see the last revision updated over here, and the Steam client releases over there. You can elect to participate in beta versions of the client as well to get more aggressive updates from them as well. And we ran all these miserable command lines in the terminal. We could have just looked at this beautiful UI. <laughs> you guys are just geeks. It's OK. I'll, I'll subscribe to that. Um, I didn't know that was there. Um, there is, oh, interface, there we go. So under interface and graphics interface, you have to check that checkbox that says, when I highlight it, you can't read it, uh, enable access to the Linux desktop. And then from there, you can actually do all of your, um, all of your deeds and, 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 and actions. So yeah, it's kind of nice that you have the ability to do that. Um, I think there's a game running in the background, so we can show that in a second. I just want to see if there's anything useful in the last few slides that we haven't covered. Um, I think we're almost there, so let's just do that. I'm online, I'm back online, I don't know. He, didn't want, he wanted me to go back to the slides earlier. This thing has a mind of its own. Um, we're switching again. It's already switched over there, don't, don't think that it's, it's slow doing it. It's uh, our beautiful setup over here. Um, you can add apps, I use Skype as an example. You can go download Skype from the actual Skype repository and add it to your Steam box, which is kind of cool. Support video? Sorry? Are you support video conference? I don't know, I haven't tried. Uh, I don't see why not. Some people have reported some issues depending on their hardware environment. Um, there is no camera built into it, but it supports all the USB support. So if you plug in a USB camera, USB class camera, it'll, it'll work. I'm almost willing to sign off on that. And if you have a audio input, it'll support that as well. One interesting thing about this machine that I noticed when I was looking at it, there is no analog in and out for audio out of that. So it's really geared towards gamers. You have to use a USB headset or a wireless audio headset in order to use it, uh, or the HDMI out for the audio. But there is literally no, for this particular model, uh, analog audio in or out of it. So you would need a USB headset and a USB camera to be able to do video conferencing out of it. Um, the reason I picked that as an example, the actual Debian package packaged by Skype for Wheezy is for an older version of Debian in 32-bit, and still it works fine on SteamOS, just to show you how close they stuck to Debian. If it works on Debian, even on an earlier version of Debian, it will run on SteamOS, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, how does Valve contribute back? It's a question I, I imagine you're curious about. So they sponsored DebConf twice in a row as a gold sponsor. We're very thankful for that. They've actually presented SteamOS at DebConf last year, and, um, and they have donated uh, Steam code keys to Debian developer as well, um, so that people can play their games for free and not be productive on Debian instead. Um, you know, uh, um, like I said, Valve is working with LunarJ on uh, their Mesa work, and uh, just wanted to plug in that. Collabra as a company, if you're curious about what we do, we do the upstream release management for Mesa, for example. That's one of the many, many things we do open source. Uh, and what we did for them is set up the, the infrastructure for the very early on SteamOS beta, uh, the whole package management, and ultimately what I think is we, we try to help them keep the Steam machines as open as possible. Um, so how does that work? The GitHub, 
You can go to Valve Software, find the SteamOS details. There's a bunch of wiki pages that explain to you how to do it. Uh, just ask you to respect the code of conduct that they have in there. It's literally like 10 lines. And, uh, and you're on your way. You can actually go ahead and uh, contribute to SteamOS or play with it and do a beautiful thing with it. Um, if you want to know that it's a successful uh, distribution or not, they already are derivatives of the derivative. That's pretty neat. Um, a friend of mine created a distribution called Stevenson's Rocket that basically is intended to, you know, people like you that want to play with it but don't want to completely break yourself. It's basically a much more flexible installer for SteamOS. It actually uses the Debian installer by default but doesn't auto answer a lot of the questions. So you can deal with your disk partitioning, you can lay out the partitions on the drive the way you want and all that stuff so you don't shoot yourself in the foot so violently. And then the other one is VaporOS that basically brings all those legacy uh, game emulators to SteamOS in a very nice package way. I think it even shows up in your library and things like that. I don't know exactly how it works. Um, but people uh, that want this sort of stuff are, are investing. They're contributing. They're, they're sending packages. Some of them are, are accepted by Valve um, that, that were relevant. And initially, they thought they wouldn't need that in order to address their market. And they probably still don't from a commercial standpoint. But it was small enough and non-intrusive that they thought, why not? We can actually go ahead and put that in. And, and so they did it. These are a few examples of that, the main one being uh, compatibility with holder hardware. Don't make assumptions that things only work in a certain way. Uh, the interactive installer I just mentioned. Um, the last thing I wanted to bring up is I've seen uh, some places where it says Steam ready out of the box, stickers, people claiming compatibility with SteamOS, uh, not on behalf of Valve or anybody else. I just want to say be very careful. If it's not actually on the Steam OS website, mentioned as a Steam machine, preloaded with it, do your research. Don't get stuck with some piece of hardware that's not really compatible with it. We've seen some of those out there already. And um, instead, you can, you can go and, and get one of these um, over here. I think I had opened up that page earlier. But you can find it easily, Steam machines, Steam OS, and you, you can find all the proper links there. So what's going to change in the future? I swear I'm almost done. Uh, uh, improve the user experience. They're going to continue to iterate. Uh, whether it continues to look like XBMC, like you said, or we go some other directions as they see fit based on user feedback, that will happen and, and it will be great. I, I can't wait to see what they're going to come up with next. Remember, primarily, we'll be driven by this and that's what makes it really cool. Um, uh, and there, there potentially are some use cases beyond gaming that people might be interested in. That's what I should have done all along. Look at that. Um, <laughs> Yeah, um, improve the file system and setup. Like we said, they probably want to switch to a more system-based updates rather than uh, app-based updates. OS trees we already have done things like that for other customers, so we feel quite ready to potentially help with this. Um, but they have brilliant people that are currently considering their designs, and there are other really good GNU Linux-based systems that are using mechanisms like that. I think a shout out to Google and the Chrome OS team for the work that they've done in democratizing something that is a lot closer to the GNU Linux that we know compared to Android is pretty brilliant. And the other thing they're looking at is application containerization so that there's a, a, a better control there as well. So yeah, with that, um, that's it. All right, so I'd love, thank you guys. We'll take some questions, and I will take this opportunity to say that we have uh, free vouchers, four books, and based on the quality of our questions, I might already give some away, or I might ask some random questions based on something that was printed in one of those terminals earlier. I actually took one of the books. Okay. Three books. Um, Tijun, go ahead. Sure. Um, so, um, like, one of the things that which bothers me when trying to play games on PC is that there are just so many things to configure. Like, me have to uh, go into graphics setting and, you know, uh, resolution, shaders, and whatnot. So, I was, I'm just kind of curious that, like, for Steam machines, for different tiers, um, does Steam OS configure that automatically? That's a great question. So, we can look at that real quick. Um, the first portion of your answer is yes. I, I was given a really good example of people trying to set the audio interface and they couldn't get there. Imagine this is 10 foot UI, so you're sitting on a couch, you have a 60 inch TV in front of you, you're using Windows and you have to plug in your USB headset and get the driver and all that. It's a miserable user experience, it doesn't work well. Here, uh, the UI enables you to do that. So had the hardware enablement layer, it's pretty straightforward. You can come in here and you can, you can pick the interfaces that you want to be able to do that, they'll be listed over here. We can do some cool 
experiment real quick. Um, Okay, this is flying off the reservation, but I wanted to try that, so we're gonna give it a shot. I have a USB DAC here, as an example. Um, so, pretend this is a headset. For all intensive purposes, this is a headset, right? I'm gonna get out of the UI here, and then you can plug that in here. I've not tried this. Um, but if I go back to, I'm gonna go back one screen, just in case. And if I say, uh, reconfigure audio, I now have a USB DAC, so. So yes, it does make these things really quite easy to do. That's at the hardware enablement layer. Now, the follow-on to your question is, what happens in the game itself, right? So Steam isn't rewriting the games. So when you take something like Portal 2, which I think is running, or will be running in a second, um, they've already done some profiles for the controller to make it run well with the game, and so they've already adapted it uh, quite a bit for that. Uh, but some other games don't. So there are a few warning messages in a few games that you start at where it says, you're gonna need to fiddle with the controller a little bit to get it to work the way you want. But that UI is really cool. So as soon as the game is up and running, I'm gonna try to show that to you. Um, I pre-configured it so that it would have the same resolution as what we have there, so there we are. So if I go, the options screens and all that, they're the standard screens that you'll get for the normal applications. That's what you were complaining about. That UI is not very good and not easy to configure. But here on Steam, I can go in here. That's the Steam Portal UI. It's that uh, overlay I was talking about that can take over the game. So I can do here, and I can do controller. And now I have this brilliant UI where I can actually go ahead and configure everything. So I have pre-configured ones. I can do uh, FPF controls. I can change uh, the default menu controls. Um, I haven't done too much of that myself because I get lost. I have no idea what the best configuration for the games would be. But you can set the sensitivity for each of the controls individually, change the axes and all that. That you can all do outside the game itself. So in terms of the controls configuration for the game, it all comes right here. You can also do some controller HUD integration as part of the game or outside. And if you go back to the game, unfortunately, the final portion of your answer is, yes, you still go through here if you want to configure. So for example, this, the first time I started Portal 2 on this, I had a full HD display, but it was some random VGA, low graphics settings still. Again, don't blame SteamOS for that. It's the game itself, it's the way it's packaged and delivered. There could be some additional intelligence that comes there. I'm sure it's something they're considering, but I think that already having the overlay and being able to do these configurations right here goes a really long way. So, um, like, so, and with the presentations over, can you show us, like, rebooting the machine into the um, gaming mode? Like, yeah, 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 absolutely. Later? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, Cor. That's really beautiful. Um, I seemed like you said something about the software that's running on the controller, and I sort of missed it. Um, yes. You're saying that the controller is running, the, there's a chip on the controller, and it's running what? It's a proprietary system. Um, the chip itself is an NXP chip. Um, uh, but you can tag into it, and you can configure it, and you can run through it, and you can get additional details on how to do that. It's still early stages of that customization, but this is open as well, and you'll be able to tinkle directly with the controller itself. So the source, the source for the, what's running on there is posted? That I do not know, honestly. I, I haven't researched it that far to be able to say that, but I did look far enough to say that you can plug into it. So you, technically, you can debug it. So you okay. can do things you can't do with others. Uh, that's accessible. Um, as far as releases and all that, I think it's all in the works. Sorry, I don't know which one of you was first. I'll go with you. So the most important question is, do you know yeah. when Half-Life 3 is coming out? <laughs> it's actually funny, I get that reference. I do know that much. Uh, yeah, I think a lot of people like you care, and I have no idea. Um, I, I will say that back 10 years ago when I last played video game, I think that the very last video game I've ever played was Half-Life 1. And that was great. So I hope we can get to play Alpha 5 3 together. Can we, can we just riff off of that and ask you if there's ever going to be a SteamOS version 3? Or are they just going to stop it too? <laughs> Again, I, I can't speak for Valve. I have no idea. I have a feeling that unless they go completely crazy and innovate over the moon for it, I don't see why not. Um, yeah, I hope there is, because that's the only way I'll get to play it. Uh, disclosure, I, I don't have anything at home that's not somewhat based on open and free software. So this is the first time ever in a very long time I have a gaming platform. I bought this for myself. This is not something provided by Valve or Collabora. I, I bought this in order to be able to show it to you today. But serious question is, um, if I buy one of these boxes from manufacturers, uh -huh. 
how long should I expect to get updates for them? Like, is oh. it going to be something like Android phones that six months later, that's it? Or is it going to be something along the lines of? That's a really good question. So there is a, a bunch of aspects to that. Um, the Steam runtime itself, there is a significant investment by Valve to be able to continue to provide compatibility for you. So as a game user, you'll be able to keep playing games on that platform. Even new titles will come in and they'll be compatible with that environment. That's the first thing. The second one is, for a lot of the infrastructure that we've created, we intend to continue to deliver software updates because it's pretty low touch. It sort of happens on its own. And, and it keeps you safe, it, uh, it provides the security updates and other means of software uh, updates that you would need. Um, as far as the life cycle of the software itself, I can't speak to that. I have a feeling that if you're an avid gamer, you're gonna wanna replace the hardware probably before the software comes out of, of life anyway. So for that, you know, uh, there'll be other great use for something this powerful, but maybe not powerful enough to play the games that you would wanna play on it. Yes, please, you've been patient. <clears throat> When it comes to streaming, um, most of the content providers, um, Amazon, Hulu, um, maybe YouTube these days, uh, require some type of a DRM. Specifically on HTML5, there's a thing called media source extensions. Mm -hmm. And then on the HDMI interface itself, there's usually an HDCP um, mm -hmm. uh, encryption protocol that theoretically prevents you from uh, recording out if they don't yep. want you to. Uh, is all that supported by like a, a, a firmware blob or can you speak to the whole ecosystem that handles media uh, DRM specifically? As far as I even know, as a user, yes it does. I was able to play Netflix on it. Yes, it, it works. So um, to, to the point where the validation of the content protection on the client side from that specific example, it lets you play back. Um, in terms of the full trusted path and everything else, I'm not gonna to speculate to that. Uh, what's important is as an end user, I was able to try what I wanted to try, which was play Netflix. Yes, please. Good evening. Uh, two questions. One, in the future, uh, SteamOS will support like VR or oh, yeah, VR okay. and also ultra high definition displays in the future. What was the second question? If it was uh, okay. a 4K, is oh, they going okay. to... Okay. Um, so thank you for those questions. The first one is Valve as a company is working on VR for sure. Uh, to what extent that's actually going to flow into SteamOS, I do not know personally. But um, as, as we know, the, the game industry is one of the first one that has been taken by storm by virtual reality in terms of something that becomes consumer ready very soon. And I would expect that Valve will be one of those innovators in that space if they're not already in terms of what's publicly available. Um, so that might go into SteamOS, I do not know. As far as the second portion of your question, I'll open it from more of an open source perspective. There is nothing that would stop you from using 4K here today. It's all about horsepower, it's all about rendering capability, it's all about FPFs that you'll be able to play at. Um, we just need the OEMs to bring faster and faster hardware at the GPU, the CPU, and the whole bundle side. And as these things come up, you'll be able to do more and more in higher resolution. So I have no doubt of that. It's just HDMI 2.0, yes. On that hardware, you can't do 4K. Well, I think HDMI 2, you can now. HDMI yeah, HDMI 2 does. I think so. I haven't looked into it. Yeah. yeah. But the, the latest version of HDMI enabled you to do that, so with the really high-end stuff. But again, your limitation will be performance. It's already hard enough to do 2D and just video playback at 4K. If we're not talking about full 3D real-time rendering and all that, like I said, catch fire before anything else goes wrong. Um, uh, sorry, go ahead, please. Well, I, uh, on the topic of uh, low-level hardware support, I know, for example, an NVIDIA engineer had difficulties implementing um, on laptops who have uh, something called Optimus, which switches from the big graphics card to the weaker, power, uh, less powerful graphics card on the right. Intel chip. Is there anything proprietary like that that has snuck its way into, or had to sneak its way into the kernel on any of these? As far as I know, I don't think so. Uh, the whole kernel source tree is available publicly, so you can look for yourself. Um, 
but I don't know. I, I would be really surprised if that was the case. Uh, their intention is really to keep very close to what's available, and there is more than one OEM available, and they maintain all of them with a single kernel tree. So I would imagine that would be quite unlikely to be the case, but that's just me. I don't know for sure. Um, it, it's not the philosophy behind SteamOS, and in many ways, I think it protects us as users from having these issues. Um, also, the specific hardware that you're talking about may not be so much a target for here, because remember, the vast majority of the time, their use case is that they will want people to run full screen in that environment. They want one app to take the entire screen. So having a multiple GPU solution may not be very relevant in this case, unless you want to run them in parallel, and that's a whole different issue, um, which we know. Thank you. Yes, sir. I like your um, T-shirt. Not so much a question, but uh, since it doesn't have an analog uh, audio in and out, they have uh, little uh, USB sticks that are sound cards. Yes. That you can plug in, and you'll get your audio in and out, and it usually That's basically works right what out. Of, that one is exactly. Yeah, it yeah. works right out of the box. Most of that stuff. So I think, I think that's part of their right. intention for doing that. I think that those USB headsets that gamers use are that. And if you need a small bridge, you're absolutely right. I think a USB external sound card will do. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, sir. Uh, when I've set up my Debian environment in the past to install the Steam uh, dev file, I've had to do some things to get, I think, some 32-bit uh, libraries in order to make that run. Uh, so I'm wondering if you still, if, if that's completely 64-bit on the Steam OS and this hardware, or if there's still some 32-bit dependency. OK, cool. That's a good question. I don't know the 100% answer to your question. Um, I know that there is a whole portion of the runtime that's still 32-bit based. So as far as the games are concerned, there is, a, there is something there that's going on. Uh, but the kernel itself and all the user space and all of the desktop environment will be using the simplest linking possible and the optimized one. Um, how relevant is that for the final user? It's really down to what the game experience is going to be like, and that's what happens in the Steam runtime. So we don't want to overstretch that in terms of, of interpretations that we would have here. Um, these games work. They work great. Uh, are we going to get natively developed Linux games soon that will just kick ass on Linux and maybe a little less on other platforms? Maybe we don't want that. That's where all the users are still. But you know, it's a, it's a possibility, and, and this gives them a way to do that. You can. As far as I know, you can depend on, um, on, uh, on things that are outside of the runtime if you wanted to do that. So you would have the ability to do this if you wanted to. Yes, please. Hello. Um, what's OEM's approach to me having root? If I mess something up, does it automatically avoid my warranty? Oh. I read the ULAD in detail from SteamOS. There's nothing there that specifically says one way or the other. Uh, whether or not there's something in the OEM ULA, I don't know. Um, you're talking about like a critical hardware failure due to some user manipulation in the software. Or, or my system had other issues and I had root and there is, let's say, some sort of if use that it knows that I gained root and from that point on, they completely, for example, refuse warranty for anything else even unrelated to the stuff that I personally brought. I can't really speak to that. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, Th Valve's intention is very clear as the operating system vendor that they want you to have access to that. However, when you check that checkbox to be able to get into the desktop mode, you also do acknowledge there is a message, and I'm sure it's carefully stated to say that you have the ability to break yourself. Whether or not it voids the warranty, that I can't speak to. But you've done a lot of intentional steps to get to that point. And um, yeah, there's that. Another thing, when Valve decides that the update has to go out, do they have the final say, or does it still have to go through like OEM's certification process? Uh -huh. um, again, I don't, part, I don't know exactly. Um, but uh, Valve was internally very excited to make this happen, and I think a lot of that energy translated into the OEMs that they were working with. So in many ways, I think you were witnessing a, a more uh, energetic relationship than probably ever before when it came to an OSV and an OEM. It was a new structure that hadn't been there for quite some time. And uh, everybody has their priority. Everybody has their agenda. Um, but I, but I, think that, um, I think that Valve was, was working in conjunction with them. And they made this happen. They made this happen with multiple OEMs. So, 
uh, yeah. They, you'll always be constrained by things like ODM in factory processes and things like that, but they've made it work. The box is on the desk right now. But is there something along the lines of Android where Google announces a new version of Android and then you have to wait a year and a half to get update, or is it something like Apple where they announce it and you install it the same day? Right, it's somewhere in between. They don't control the hardware and the software. They're not Google. Uh, I imagine that they want to do many things right, and in my perspective, they are. And, and I think it shows their efficiency in working with the ODMs, in working with the OEMs to releasing the platform on the date that was stated a long time ago is a big testimony to that. So, um, yeah, I, I think you'll see innovation, you'll see new releases, you'll see things progressing. The UI will improve, the user experience will improve, and all of that is... Uh, it's going to make a, a big difference. Yeah. Last thing for me, um, are there any existing hardware or like, is there any talk to support TV tuners or cable cards so that I can actually use this thing to replace my cable box? The Linux kernel. Whatever you can do with Linux, you can do in here. You'll be dependent on these alternative UI and applications to do the rest of the work. As far as feature sets, potentially for... Can we bring the sound up for the PC? Is that all right? If you can add the sound of the computer. Oh, yeah, I, I broke it. Oh, maybe it will fall back by itself. Let's see. Because I think the robot is trying to talk to him, and that's why he can solve the problem. Yeah. You see, let's see if we can. Um, yeah, the audio comes out of the HDMI, but I broke that with this. Um, the question was, sorry, I, f I forgot. Cable cards, yes. Like I said, Linux kernel, uh, third-party applications, you have all the Debian repositories available to you right there. You, you can take those and, uh, and put them on there. A lot of people have talked about projects like Kodi, XBMC, and others to be able to do that. A standard USB 2, USB 3 on the box, have at it. Yes, Brian? I have a number of questions. Feel free to cut me off at any time. No worries. Okay. To date, most of uh, the games and the we see on Steam OS or desktop game ports. Have you heard about any plans for innovative living room only controllers like the Wii Remote or Xbox Connect, which might enable living room optimized games? And if you haven't, that's fine. I do not know. Uh, okay. I, I, I'm sure that there are conversations like that. I'm sure that part of the notion of me making the controller open is that people can tinkle with that without starting from scratch. I'm sure that all those things are happening. Uh, but as far as I know, uh, it was already a daunting task to get those games to work well in the living room with that controller. So there is sort of that iteration that's going. Uh, and, and of my own very limited experience, a few of the games I cared about to try, I already had to tinkle with the controller so that it was sensible to me to use. Okay. And then, okay, so Linux shared, Linus shared some thoughts last year at DevConf that he believed SteamOS and Chrome OS would eventually lead to cracking the Linux on the desktop nut. It's now over a year later. I mean, you've been involved in this. Do you see anything like that happening? What are your thoughts there? I mentioned that briefly in my very introduction. I, I've been doing this for a long time. I was once quoted as being the guy to say it's the year of the Linux desktop a <laughs> bunch of years ago. So I live with that for a long while. Um, uh, I'm comfortable with it now. Uh, I've talked to people about it. Uh, it's. Um, yeah, I mean, it's to me, like I said, the, I just got this laptop uh, from work a little while ago because mine is falling apart. And uh, yeah, I was blown away. You just get the F23 installation media and everything works. I didn't have to tinker with anything whatsoever. I can watch Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Video from this laptop without doing any customization whatsoever. So if you ask me from where I stand, and I think a lot of you in this room, yeah, it's gone a really long way. It's, uh, is it there? It's impossible to tell. Do we have the market shares? Maybe we don't quite yet, but those Chromebooks sell like hotcakes. And uh, to me, they're, uh, they're, they're pretty awesome. And, uh, uh, and, and that team is doing really good work. And that team is really trying to work very close to the Linux kernel. And remember, they didn't take easy, easy decisions. A lot of those Chromebooks are now um, ARM architecture-based, which is not where a lot of the tinkering desktop experience work is being done. And they still work really well. And you really do get like 12 hours of battery life on those. So combine that with SteamOS, living room experience, clamshell form factor for yeah, we're, we're getting there. It's exciting. Um, can you talk a little bit about the custom OBS? Are there instructions if I wanted to set up my own? Like, like 
I don't know if everybody knows what OBS is kind of uh, thing. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, the OBS is the open build service. It was initially done by Suze plugin. I used to work for Suze. And uh, we used it to create our enterprise as well as over distributions there. Uh, I think that some of the guys that work there are some of the cleverest engineers I've ever worked with. And, uh, and I, when I came at Collabora, I, I asked that if we could please consider using that for um, basically open source project binary creation. What it does, it basically spawns off all sorts of workers, it scales extremely well, and it basically gives you the ability to provision uh, binary package repositories in a very clever way, some level of access control, and, and all of that. If you wanted to do what we do here with OBS, there's a few magic things that were done specifically to get Debian to build well with, with OBS in this environment, because by default, OBS is uh, RPM-based, um, the way sensible things should. Kidding, uh, and and so yeah, I think uh, I think there is great documentation from Suze itself on the Open Build service. I invite you to look at that. If you have any questions or there are things you would want to be able to accomplish that you can't with just that documentation, let me know and I'll be happy to help. And I have two more questions. I'll ask them both. <laughs> um, um, so go ahead. Uh, do you see any issues? So you know, let me ask them both and then you can answer. Do you see any issue rolling from Debian eight to Debian nine? And um, this is just like a simple question. Can the Steam box be the source for the streaming that you mentioned earlier? Uh, there was an issue for a little, I'll answer your question in the reverse, reverse order. There was a small issue where the streaming solution wasn't working with SteamOS, but I believe that's resolved. The intention is that any Steam client can be a source to the sync uh, streaming solution which is really cool, I invite you to take a look at it. I wish I could have demonstrated it here. It's, it's really nice, it's amazing what they can achieve um, there. And then the second question, I'll be honest, I don't know, because I am not a Debian developer myself, I'll be completely honest with that, so I don't know what the implications are of going from one stable to the next stable, but it, I think it's one of their claim of fame, and given the people I work with on a daily basis, I have no doubt that they can knock this out of the park, and they can do it on the weekend. Uh, while taking care of the kid. So, yeah, that's my perspective. Whether or not that translates into SteamOS, I don't know. But uh, that's one thing that the Debian guys do really well. Yes, sir, last question. Go ahead. Uh, oh, okay, two questions. Two Can questions. you run a sudo lsof i? <laughs> and I Excuse want to know, um, does Minecraft run on this platform? We, so the first question was sudo? lsof i. Yeah, what okay. open um, the They were playing, I don't know. Where the we are right now. Uh, there isn't very many. It's it's fairly limited. It's uh, there is not very many. There isn't very many packages installed by default as well. It's uh, pretty restrictive. Um, I know that at one point it acts as its own NTP server. Don't ask me why. Uh, but it does a few other things. It's quite limited. Uh, there isn't very many packages inside the box itself. Um, uh, but it's. Um, Again, you can expand all you want. If you want a web server, you can add that. If you want to add SSH as I did, yeah. you can do that. So there is no restriction there. Uh, again, security is a consideration, but, but also it was open and free and delivered aggressively through iterations. So there are ways that it can be improved. They were already talking about changing the way that they do updates, changing the way that they package applications. Um, and ultimately, your user has no password. So they could go out and harden this thing as much as they want. They give you the way to kill yourself anyway. So it, at one point, it's sort of limited. So the second question is, whether, do you know whether Mycraft runs on this? Mycraft? Yeah. I do not know. Um, we can find out. Can you, uh, are, did you guys restart the game? Yeah, it's okay. It, it's possible. <laughs> um, there is no Java by default, yes. Minecraft is, okay. You can add the JVM uh, on the platform. I don't know whether or not that would link to Steam by default. The, on, on an other system, the runtime could use that, so it's possible. Um, but I, like I said, I'm not a gamer, so I don't know. It's not on, thank you. Well, we have the answer. Yes. So it's not distributed through the Steam platform. Okay. Thank you so much. So from the back, the guy, the, we're being told that Minecraft, the game, is, is not in Steam, so you wouldn't get it this way. But if it runs on Linux, you could easily put it here. Cool. Um, all right, I'm supposed to ask you guys a bunch of questions based on everything that we discussed so far. Yep, trivia um, time. I'm gonna, 
Trivia time. Trivia time. So if you guys are thinking you want to answer that, please don't shout out the answers and come to the microphones instead. I have no idea what, what questions we typically I want to do. Ask. Um, we typically do is we just try to look out, let people raise their hands, and we'll pick whoever. If you want to do the picking, you can do the picking. Otherwise, I'll do the picking. You can do the picking. All right. So it's whoever I see first. Yep. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask is I've mentioned that a few times in the presentation. Roughly, how many games are available on Linux through Steam today? Um, I saw your hand first. Wow, that's right. Yeah. Um, so you Come get to up, pick your, your gift. Uh, the next thing I'm going to ask, what did you guys were curious about? Uh, uh, it's an easy one. Be, pay attention. How much RAM does this specific box have? I saw your hand come up first. That's right. Indeed. Um, what else can we ask about? Um, I don't know. What, what, was, what were you guys very curious about? Uh, how many system partitions on the disk were installed? No, I don't even remember. <laughs> Oh, what? what? Uh, that was the physical drives. I guess that's a valid answer. We'll take that. Yeah, yeah. Take it. Uh, um, <laughs> what is the current uh, latest release of Brewmaster? Um, right in the middle here. With with the hat. Oh, with the hat. Um, yeah, uh, two. Okay. Can you go to the next level of details? Otherwise, I'll give you two. It, Roughly, yes. Okay, I'll give him two. Good enough. 249 was the answer, but sir, you, you got it. Um, all right, how many other things? We have uh, three more. Three more, okay. Um, do you have a question you want to ask people? <laughs> yeah, I, was, I had a tidbit, it's not a technical one. Where do all the code names for Debian releases come from? Over here in the blue shirt. That's right. Yes. Thank you. I anyone, find that really maybe I can ask one. Does anyone know why? Uh, over here, sir. Why? Who was it? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah. If you're okay with it, let's go for that. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit of yeah. mystery to bring out there. All right, uh, maybe one more related. If you'd like to, go for it. I think that's a good try. Um, I don't know. Yes? I have a question you can ask. Please. What was the CPU architecture in this box? Uh, yeah, very well. What was the CPU architecture in this box? And the first hand up is clearly in the back there. I think we're looking more specifically for yeah, the chip architecture. but. Well, we'll give you that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it is running system. <laughs> okay. yeah. No, you want to? You want to go for it? Do you want to move? Uh, oh yeah. I, we were lo we were looking which, for Haswell, I thought. But which Intel if, generation is yeah. the GPU? Because well, that's not the instruction set. Another question. Another question. Yeah, no, that's. <laughs> oh. There's no more books. Oh wait, what happened? I thought we had a couple more. We we're done. We're, thank you, everyone. We're going to be going to um, pop. The pop burger. Are down on um, between 11th and 12th on University. Um, yeah, so we'll be leading a couple of groups down. It's not our normal uh, place, but the normal place has a trivia night, so we are not going to uh, get the nice, quiet, uh, loud environment we are used to. So yeah, pop bar down on 11th uh, and University. Thanks, everyone.